And once you have found it, let's all stand as we read the Word of God this evening, Esther chapter 4, verses 10 through 14. If you have it, give me a good strong amen. amen. Scripture says in verse 10, again, Esther spake unto Hatak, and gave him commandment unto Mordecai, all the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces do know that whosoever, whether man or woman, shall come unto the king into the inner court, who is not called, there is one law of his to be put to put him to death, except such to whom the king shall hold out the golden scepter, that he may live. But I have not been called to come in unto the king these thirty days. And they told to Mordecai Esther's words, then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, Think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews, for if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time. Then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come? to the kingdom for such a time as this. Mordecai asked the question, he said, who knoweth? Who knoweth if thou, whether thou art come to such a kingdom? He, he, was, he, was, he was trying, to, it wasn't so much that he was pointing to her ability as he was to God's ability to use her in the position that she was in tonight. I hope you listen tonight. I want to just take those two words, who knoweth? I want to talk to us about that tonight. Father, I'm grateful tonight that you're a God, that you don't have to have a bunch of people to do a work. You could literally take a group of people like what we have here tonight. God, you could take this crowd tonight to turn this city upside down for thee. Lord, you took 11 disciples. Those 11 disciples, along with the rest of the church, went throughout Jerusalem and then went to Antioch. And they, they, they went around and turned their world of their day upside down for you. Lord, I believe here at Maranatha Baptist Church, we are a church that you could use the same way. I pray that you'd allow me to be a help to your people, I ask, in these next few minutes. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. These times that Esther lived in were desperate times. The king had made a decree by the wicked Haman that every Jew was to be killed on a certain day. The king did not know, he did not know that, Hes that Esther was a Jew. So therefore, he, he went ahead and made the law, and then finally the, the law began to spread around the land. A man by the name of Mordecai came, and he told, he told Esther, said, Esther, you're going to have to do something. You're the queen. You're, God's given you this place that you're in, and for no, for maybe for such a time as this. And he said, who knoweth whether God can use you for this time to do something to turn this nation around, to save our people. We have to understand that when he talked to her at first, he says, you got to go in. She goes, I can't go in. She says, the king has to, hand, has to put out his golden scepter, and if he doesn't turn, put out that golden scepter, when someone walks into the palace, they will kill that person. And she says, just because I'm queen doesn't mean that can't happen to me. He says, Esther, he says, now don't forget. He says, God put you there. God put you in that position. And you've got to understand, Esther, in, for such a time as this, God has placed you um, to, to help save his people from the destruction of this wicked man named Haman. He says, who knoweth whether God could do something? One of the greatest questions that, Morde that was asked was, who knoweth? Mordecai was saying this. He says, who knoweth if God won't do something through you? He was saying, who knoweth if you are the person whom God is going to use greatly? He said, who knoweth if everything that has happened in your life happened for such a time as this? You see, Esther's parents were killed. Esther's, Esther was raised by Mordecai. And Mordecai had that influence on Esther. And Esther now is in that, in that position of power. And Mordecai was simply saying to her, who knoweth whether God has done all of this in your life to save his people from the sword of destruction. Mordecai was saying, we will never know, Esther, what God can do through you until you step out. He was saying, we will never know 
if God will save us unless you're willing, get this now, to risk it all. He was saying, we will never know if God is going to use you unless you're willing to put it all on the line for the sake of God. He says, we'll never know if God will put you, if God puts you on this earth at this time until you step out and do something to see if God's going to use you at this time. He says, we don't know. He says, we don't know if it's you or someone else, but I know this, we'll never find out until you step out. We're never going to know if God's going to use you for such a time as this unless you're the one that opens your mouth and you're the one that puts it on the line and you're the one that forgets about your past and you're the one that understands the need of this nation. He says, who knows? Who knows whether God's going to use you to save this? You see, it all rested on Esther's willingness to step out. Follow me very carefully. We live in America in desperate times. Can I just say to you tonight, I try to, when I look at the scriptures, I try not to look at the scriptures through the viewpoint, through the prism of the United States of America, because God didn't write his book to the United States of America. He wrote his book to the world. We are just a part of the world. Listen to me very carefully. And we, everything that happens, I hear people all the time, pre preachers say, God's going to, God's certainly got to come because everything that's happening in America, I got news for you, we're not the only nation in this world. Right, right. There's a lot of other nations. There's a lot of, what, another, there's wickedness going on all around the world. But I do know this. I do know that America is in desperate times. I do know I live in America and I do know my nation needs somebody to say, you know what? I don't know if God could use me or not, but who knows if God could use me? We live in desperate times when pornography becomes the halftime shows at sporting events. Listen to me, I did, not, I did not watch it. I read about it the next day. I saw the stink that happened about everything that happened at the Super Bowl show. And any man that even watched that ought to come down to the altar tonight and get right with God. It, listen to me, ladies are not a tool that men lust after. Ladies are human beings that ought to be respected in such a manner. And for NFL, for the NFL to use the ladies the way they did, it's an atrocity. I'm saying America's in desperate times. Amen. We're in desperate times. When major retailers support the sodomite agenda, which is an abomination against Almighty God. Amen. I know if we were to start boycotting every retailer, we probably wouldn't be able to go to any retailer. But there are some retailers that just kind of put it out there in the front a little bit more that just kind of want to poke the eye of God as if it's okay. And I've got news for you. It's not okay. People say, oh, uh, you're, you're, you're biased. No, I, I'm just telling you right now. I'm against sodomy as much as I'm against adultery, as much as I'm against fornication. It's all wrong. Anything outside of the boundaries of marriage, listen to me, is an abomination against God. Somebody can say amen right there. We live in desperate times. We live in desperate times when alcohol is rampant in our nation. I want to say this, and I'll say this till the day I die. Alcohol is still the devil's juice. Amen. Listen, when, when I was telling the teachers in the, in, the Sunday school, um, um, in, the, in the Sunday school teachers meeting, do you realize that 45% that, that of the violent crimes, alcohol is, is involved in 45% of the violent crimes? You could drop crime dramatically if you took alcohol off the street. Well, I need, it to, I need it to calm my nerves. Why don't you get in the Word of God and cast all your care upon Him? Amen. Alcohol doesn't calm your nerves. It just knocks you out for a little bit until you come back and you're facing the same problems again. They're just a whole lot worse after you come back after your drunken stupor. Listen, we live in desperate times. In, when drugs are an epidemic in our nation. I mean an epidemic. 
You know, I, I've only been in the state of Oklahoma for almost two years now. And I've, never, I've never seen a state that has more drugs than the, than the state of Oklahoma. And I'm saying somewhere we've got to understand the hope of this state right here is in a church like this that tries to lead these people to Christ to get them off the addiction of drugs and get them connected with Christ. Why? Christ can give you a high that drugs can never give. You see, we're living in desperate times. When marijuana is legalized, as if it's just another cup of coffee. You can barely walk anywhere without having the stench of marijuana everywhere. And by the way, let me just say this. Anybody in our church, listen, you can keep on coming to our church, but I'm telling you, marijuana is wrong. It's wrong. And you know it is. We live in desperate times. When there's corruption in high places, Hollywood programs are nothing more than a magnet than a promotion of sin. Public schools have become places of indoctrination of sin. Living in adultery together no longer bothers um, believers as well as society. And young, mar- and young people are disrespectful to authority and is cheered if it fits the world's agenda. Listen to me. Something in America, we live in desperate times in our nation right now. In these, sadly, in these desperate times, churches are downsizing their bus ministries instead of increasing their bus ministries. Can I tell you right now, I don't plan on downsizing the bus ministry of Maranatha Baptist Church. The more that God can give us workers and drivers, we'll increase that. Why? Because there's people all over the city that need a ride to church so they can hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Can I just tell you, hey, don't downsize, increase. In these desperate times, so winnings, so many ministries have been replaced with community service groups and trying to impress society instead of trying to get out there and keep someone out of hell. Let me tell you something. Church, God didn't tell the church to go out there and pick up trash in the middle of the highway. God commanded the church to get out there, keep somebody out of hell. That's what God commanded us to do. Sunday schools are being canceled. Night church is no longer considered important. You've heard some of the missionaries come through. They say church, Sunday night church is like a skeleton in most churches. Listen, this is a low crowd tonight. And we got a decent crowd. Get this now. We got a lot of people out who are sick. And yet, look at the crowd that God's given. I mean, hey, thank God for Sunday night church. King James Bible is being replaced with perversions. Believers are more faithful to sporting events than they are church. You know, why is it that when people get sick, they'll still go ahead and watch the sporting events, but they're too sick to come to church? Somebody help me out there. Amen. If you're too sick to go, I remember when I was a boy. My mom, you've heard me tell this story when I was a boy. If we missed church, everything was off. Everything was off. We had to lay in bed all day long until we got better. He said, you had a mean mom. No, I had a mom that loved God. I'd love, to be able, I'd love to be able to go. I'd love to be able to go to all the homes of all the people who call themselves sick on Sunday morning and say, okay, get in bed and don't get up. Give me your phones. Give me your iPads. Turn off the television. You got to lay there all day. Can't talk to anybody. Just lay there. Are you serious, preacher? Isn't it amazing? How we live in desperate times, but the place that can change society has become, uh, well, you know, we can push that one out. No, hey, America needs churches. Preaching has been replaced with self-help sermons and, and or, or speeches instead of um, thus saith the Lord type of preaching. Full-time service is no longer a consideration of young people. Instead, we're pushing them to education. We're pushing them to society. We're pushing them to go to the military. And I'm not against those things if that's what God wants them to do. But our church ought to be saying to our young people, hey, why don't you serve God with the rest of your life? Why don't you become a preacher, an evangelist, a missionary? Why don't you serve God with your whole life? Ought not to be the last choice, ought to be the first choice. 
One thing that I've always realized in my life is that God could have placed me on this earth in any other timeline. But he didn't. I know I may sound like a T-Rex dinosaur tonight. You can call me T-Rex Domley. That's okay. But I just believe that the old time ways still work. Still believe calling sin, sin. Still believe in pointing out what sin is. I'm not saying hate the sinner. I'm not saying belittle the sinner. I'm saying make sin sound as ugly as you can. Love the sinner. Try to get them right. Try to get them saved. Try to get them back in church. But in the meantime, there's got to be some place that preaches truth without cutting the corners. Why? Because America needs it. That's why. God purposely gave me my family my family situations for such a time as this. My daddy sits in prison, has been in prison for 14, almost 15 years. I can gripe and complain about it, or I can say, you know what, God allowed, God put me in that family so that I can experience those hurts for such a time as this. I grew up in a preacher's home. Do you get that twitch too, Katie? I'm not sure. Because God knew growing up in a preacher's home would be helpful for such a time as this. God allowed me to travel as an evangelist across this country and across this world for 28 years for such a time as this. God's allowed me to fight the battles that I fought in my ministry for such a time as this. You know, God's even, get this now, allowed me to take this great church at 49 years of age for such a time as this. I could question and say, God, why didn't you give me a church earlier? But I don't need to worry about that for such a time as this. For this time, in this place, God has placed me here. He's given me my background. Who knoweth whether God's going to do something here at Maranatha Baptist Church? Who knoweth if God's going to allow me to be the pastor of a church that grows to, to reach this area for Christ? Who knoweth whether God's going to do it? I'll tell you right now, I'll never know until I get out there and try to keep every person I can out of hell and try to encourage others. Hey, come with me. Let's try to reach this area for Jesus Christ who knoweth I do know this we will never know what God can do with us until we trust God and get out there and do something for him I do know that you may see yourself as unable to make any impact on this world listen to me but we will never know until you trust God that he knew what he was doing to allow the things that have happened in your life for such a time as this. I don't know why God allowed you all to use your chi lose your cho child at the age that you lost him. But I do know this. He did it for such a time as this. I don't understand why God allowed certain people to go through certain things, but I do know this. You say, but preacher, my past is bad, and I don't know. I don't know. Listen to me. Don't you think God knew? Listen. You say, but, but what we need is we need another Elijah, and we need another Elijah. We don't need another Elijah today. We need you. We don't need another Elisha today. We need you. We don't need another Noah today. We need you. We don't need another Paul today. We need you. We don't need another um, another um, Peter today. We need you. Do you understand? If God wanted Peter to live in 2020, he'd let Peter be born in 2020. But he wasn't born in 2020. He wasn't living in 2020, but you are. You are. You say, but preacher, you just don't understand. I mean, I, I don't know if God can ever do something. Well, who knoweth until you trust God? If God needed great men from the past to do today's work, he would have allowed them to live in our day. But they don't have to live in our day, and they don't live in our day, but you do. And you've got to trust that God knew what he was doing to allow you to be born in such a time as this. May I go on further to say, we will never know what God can do with you until you step out by faith. 
Listen to me very carefully. Some of you are so afraid of failure that you won't. Listen, Esther was afraid. Well, what happens if he don't let me in? Stop worrying about failure. What if it comes? What if it doesn't come? Who knoweth whether God could use you? But preacher, my past is bad. But who knoweth if God could use your past? Have you ever looked at the characters God used in the Bible? Most of the characters God uses in the scriptures, listen to me, would not be allowed in most churches today. Somebody help me out. Moses killed some with his bare hands. Paul was a mass murderer. David committed, committed, uh, uh, committed, or he, he committed adultery and put a contract on a man's life. Somebody help me out. Yet God used them. John Mark was a quitter. The apostles all ran, went running and fleeing when Jesus was getting crucified. Right. Oh, but my past is bad. I don't think God could ever use me. Oh, let me tell you something. Whatever your past is, I'm telling you right now, God can use your past. If you just say, stop letting that past be a crutch and say, well, I just can't do anything. Stop letting it be your crutch and say, okay, I can't change my past, but I got a God who's greater than my past and can take that past to allow me to do something in such a time as this. Who knoweth unless I just step out? Hey, hey, hey. Preacher, I'm not the smartest person in the world. You don't have to be the smartest person in the world. God can use a donkey to preach. I think he could use you. I think you're smarter than a donkey. Come on now, somebody help me out. Well, I'm just not a, I'm not a conversationalist who says that God can't take your, young, your tongue and use it. Preacher, I'm just not a people person. You don't have to be a people person. You just have to be a God person who trusts an almighty God that he can work through you. Hey, who knoweth whether your God's put you on this earth for such a time as this? Preacher, you don't understand. I don't think I could ever be a Sunday school teacher. Well, who knoweth? Until you step up. We will never know whether you're the one that God chooses to use for such a time as this to do a great work until you step out and start serving God. Saying it is impossible for God to do anything won't change what's happening inside of this day. Listen to me. We could sit here tonight and we can say, well, uh, it's too dark in 2020. We'll never see revival. If that's the case, close the church down. Do you realize that God would have saved Sodom and Gomorrah if he had just found ten righteous people? Because God still had hope in Nineveh when nobody else did. Do you understand? There's no place that's too wicked for God to change. There's no time that's too hard for God to change. There's no place that's so deep that God can't pull them out of the depths of sin that they're in. Hey, God can still do something in this old nation. God says, for the eyes of the Lord run to and fro. Throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on the, in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect towards him. Listen to me. God sure can't, I want you to listen very carefully. God sure can't do anything through you if you continue to live in sin. Some of you know you're doing wrong. But you refuse to get right. The facade of getting right is not enough. 
You could, you could, and listen, and, and listen, we all know what kind of facade to put on. We know what kind of makeup to put on to kind of cover up so everybody thinks I'm making a change. But God knows your heart, and God knows that sin is the biggest deterrent from him being able to do something through a person's life. I'm saying tonight, there's some altars here tonight where people in this church and this congregation tonight need to come down to an old-fashioned altar and say, God, tonight it's time I come completely clean. I get rid of my sin. Why? Oh, who knows if God could use me. But I'll never know as long as I live in sin. What is everybody else going to think? Who knows? Until you step out. She will never know what God can do unless you get involved. Sitting on the sidelines is not the option. Listen to me. Get involved. Get involved. Say where? There's always a place to get involved. There's a bus you can ride. There's a soul winning time you can come to. There's a place you can go and get involved. Listen to me. Ought not to be the same old people doing everything. Ought to be a waiting list of people saying, I'll be the next guy to step up. Get involved. I hate to tell you this. There's a lot of the old timers in this church. They're not going to live forever. As much as I wish that they would live until I go to heaven, they're not going to. Some are going to pass off the scene. Listen, some of you young timers, listen to me. You can play your games. You can go out there and say, well, I'm just going to keep on doing my little worldly stuff, going to my little concerts and playing in the world, and this church will die, and this city will die and go to hell. Why? Because we're not getting involved. Hey. We talked about some of the old timers this morning. I was talking to some of them this morning. Listen to me. They're not going to always be around. You look at our labor force, and I've got a lot of the senior saints who are involved in this church. It's time some of the young ones step up. We'll never know. Until you give it your all. I'm talking to some of you tonight. You've been serving God on a reserve. You're not, you're not in overdrive. I can't depend on you. Because I don't know if you're here or there. Gone or here. You're going to miss this time and hear this next time. You got to sit in the seat with Brother Harjo and I on Sundays. We're trying to plug holes of people who are last minute not letting us know. We're trying to fill the gaps. I thought this morning we both were going to pull our hair out. I think Brother Hardwell actually got a gray hair this morning. I'm not sure. Listen, but, but, but what about this over here? What about this church? You realize the greatest thing you could ever do right now is get involved in this church? Give it your all in this church? What about the world? What, let me ask this question. What's running a 5K or 10K race going to do for an eternity? And I'm not against running 5K and 10K races other than I can't do it. I'm not even sure if I can run a .5K. But anyway, somebody help me out. We're so, we get more excited over the events of the world than the thing that actually changes lives. It excites me to see the lives being changed inside of this church. When I, listen to me, some of you are missing out on your life. You're missing it out. Why? Because you're just, you're, you're just holding back. Stop holding back. Get involved. 1.3 million people in this area. There's somebody you can reach. There's a class you can fill. 
Some of you, listen, some of you are involved, you kind of lost your fire, you've lost your zip. Who knoweth? Who knoweth? Whether God could do something through you. The grass always looks greener on the other side. But you'll get over there and you're going to look back and say, boy, I, I sure do miss those days. I was in a church in Indiana for many years. We averaged 15,000 every Sunday watching people get saved and baptized by the dozens, if not the hundreds, weekly. While I was there, I was not trying to find some other place and say, well, what about this and what about that and what about that? I buried myself there. We could take for granted what God's doing at Maranatha Baptist Church. Let me tell you something. It'll come and it'll go. And some will be looking back and say, boy, I wish I'd have got involved in those days. Do you realize I was, looking at the, I was looking at a Sunday school? We were a little bit down today, but we were still 100 above what we had last year. Do you understand that? And, and, and so you're missing the miracle that's going on here because you're so wrapped up in everything else. At some point, I was talking to Brother Jim. He said, he said, boy, preacher, he said, it's been good to see what's going on here. He's excited about it. Lives being changed. Who knoweth? If God's going to use us. Can I go one step further? I want to talk to the young, young ones, the teenagers a little bit. Who knoweth whether God could use you for such a time as this unless you just give your life to God and surrender your life to serve Him full time? I sat in the front row of a pew in Salinas, California, where I grew up. Sat in the front row of that pew and on a Monday night in a missions conference. A man by the name of James Holder preached on Nineveh. Talked about Nineveh was about to die and they needed somebody to stand up for that city. I sat there. You ever have one of those services where it felt like all of a sudden everybody almost disappears, just you and the preacher? I was sitting on that front row, that pew that morning or that evening. It was like everybody else left. It was just like me and the preacher. And even though the preacher was out here, it was just like he was just doing this right here. My heart was about ready to explode. So I thought about the need of our nation. That night, that invitation came. I was the first one to leave that seat, get down to that altar. And I said, God, I don't know if you could use someone like Alan Domley. We're not in a big church. No one knows, not a lot of people know our church. I'm not the best of preachers and I'm not the smartest of people, but God, if you could use me, who knoweth? Who knoweth? I got my pilot's license at age 19, almost went into the Air Force Academy which would have been the biggest mistake of my life. My, my instructor told me, he says, you could be in the Air Force, you could make six digits every year with your skill. I remember as I wrestled with God, I'd already surrendered to preach. I wrestled with God for three days in my bedroom every night. I had every excuse.
reason why God couldn't use me as a preacher. I reasoned out how maybe I could go in the Air Force and then fly jets and, 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 and get involved in that life and at 31 years of age go to the ministry. But the Holy Spirit of God kept on bringing a verse back, but seek you first kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be that unto you. He said, but God, I've already been serving in my life. He said, but seek you first. You're young adult years. Seek me first. Give me a chance. Let me see what I can do. I remember that last night. I got my license out of my wallet. And I held it up to God. And I said, God, if I never fly, if, if I never get behind the plane, uh, the, the, the yoke in an airplane, if I'm never a pilot in command again, I said, God, that is totally up to you. But God, tonight, I'm throwing this license away. And God, I'm giving my all to you. I believe, God, you can still use me. Listen to me. 51 years of age now. I don't regret that decision one iota. Some of you young people need to burn your dreams. Decide tonight, stop following the crowd. Say tonight, need to surrender my life to serve God full time. We don't have a youth department to try to show how smart we are. We don't have a youth department to try to get you to go out into the world and become a smart scientist. We have a youth department to train our young people to get out there, serve God full time. Amen. Well, what about my dreams? Who knoweth? Who knoweth? Well, if I serve God, I'm going to have to marry somebody ugly. <laughs> have you looked at yourself in the mirror? But anyway. <laughs> I just know this. God took a young boy from the hills of California. I don't know what impact my life's made in this old earth. That's what the judgment seat's all about. But I know this. Who knoweth whether God can do something here? Between 800 North Divis. God didn't give us four and a half acres of land for no reason. God's not given us all these massive buildings for no reason. For such a time as this. Who knoweth? I don't know. But we'll never know. Until some of us re-enlist, get back in the fight. You've, you've wavered. You've wavered. You know you have. Some of you need to get right with God. Some of you just need to get saved. Some of you need to surrender your life to serve God full time. Esther said, if I die, I die. She walked into that palace where the king, and don't kid yourself, she was scared to death. I guarantee it, she was praying pretty hard, Brother Harjo, when she walked inside. Oh, God, help that king to put out his golden scepter. It was self-preservation at that time. She walked into that old, that palace. That king she had not seen for over a month who had not called for her. She saw the golden scepter come out. God saved his people because of an Esther. Who said, who knoweth? Who knoweth? Brother Dorian, I don't know what God can do at Maranatha Baptist Church, but we'll never find out. To all of us to say, well... Who knoweth? God can't use a bunch of people like us. 
to show this old world that the old time religion is alive and well. We're not going to apologize for it. We're not going to go on YouTube and try to apologize for everything. For, I have nothing to apologize about the old time religion. I love it. As long as I'm pastor, I continue. I, I plan on perpetuating what I was taught. Because that's what's going to save this old nation. Father, tonight. Mordecai asked, who knoweth? Lord, we'll never know. Until we step out, we get busy. This old nation's pretty wicked. I know how disgusted I get with the sin. I can't even imagine how you look down from heaven and see it. When animals are more precious than babies in a womb, it's pretty sad. When television is more important than going to Sunday night church, pretty bad. God, tonight help us. Please help us. To understand, we'll never know until we step out, heads are bowed, eyes.